as this video is about rate of change in natural and social sciences. Let's first recap. Things we already know are, we know the slope equals change in y over change in x. We also know that change in y is, essentially, is simply the y value, the difference of the y values over the difference of the x values. So, if that's y sub 2, if we had an equation, y sub 2 is essentially f of x sub 2. If I want to find y sub 1, it's essentially f of x sub 1. x sub 2, x sub 1, let's see the numbers we're looking at. So, you know, all these things are true. We know the slope is changing y over changing x. Changing y could be expressed this way, or you could express it this way. And all that represents slope. What we also know is the slope of tangent line equals derivative. Slope or slope of tangent line equals the derivative. And we know that the derivative was equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of the function f of x plus h. Subtract f of x over h. And at some point, we decided, I might not explain it, but in the reading, at some point we decided that h was essentially the change in x. Essentially where we got this h from is that as the change in x got smaller and smaller and smaller, you can get a, a line that's closer and closer to the slope at that point. So, all right, so what we also know, I may not mention this, but in somewhere in the reading, you might have noticed that h was a substitution for change in x. All right, so h was basically a substitution for change in x. This is still change in y. This is the first x, and this is x of 2. h was basically represented by change in x. That triangle means change in. So h, h was change in x. So when we said h approaches 0, we're really considering when the change of x approach 0. So if you can understand that, in the graph, what we're really deciding was, if I had some function here, and I was trying to find the derivative or the slope at some point, what we were looking at was, if I had two points that were here and here, but if I chose to get points closer together, like instead of choosing this point, I chose a point that was closer to this one, I get a new line. If I kept choosing points that were closer and closer to it, I get a, a new line, and eventually I would get points really, really close, and I could actually find a slope at that line at that place because the points are very, very close together. So I think you might remember us using like decimals, like if x was 7, the other point we might use be 7.001 because we want to get close as close as possible. So that basically meant when the change in x approached 0, or as we said, h approached 0. All right, all that's just stuff we already know, we've been using or whatever, I just want to make sure you understood that, because this lesson is all about applying it in um, application settings and in, um, in the natural world. All right, let's go on. Oh, but before we go on, also remember that derivative was equal to the limit of h approach zero of that, which is definition derivative, is also equal to the instantaneous velocity. Or the instantaneous rate of change. All right, so it was the instantaneous velocity, which we're going to really talk about today, or instantaneous rate of change, which is another way of saying velocity. And what we should have mentioned also was the second derivative, which is the derivative of the derivative. We call that second derivative, or, du or, or double prime, was equal to acceleration. We use the right uh, derivative of derivative is a y double prime. So it'd be a y with two apostrophes on it. So y double prime. Anyway, so that equals acceleration. All right, now let's go. Oh, well. Let's just say one more thing. So let me erase some of this stuff. And using Leibniz notation, Leibniz, this is an N notation. Um, the derivative would also equal to the limit as the change in x approaches zero 
of change in y divided by change in x. So essentially the same thing as this formula. He's just a different person. He has his name on it. And um, that's a different notation for writing the definition of derivative. Uh, so this is Leibniz notation for the definition of derivative that we've learned so far. All right, now moving on. If s of t is, if s of t is the position of a particle that is moving in a straight line, then, then change in s over change in t represents the average velocity over um, a period of time change in t. And, and v equals the derivative of x with respect to t represents the instantaneous velocity of the particle. All right, this is of a note um, you can just have about the erase the screen moving forward. But before I go forward, I'm going to add something else to it. So I'm going to add more words. So if you write this, I'm going to erase the screen and add more uh, of a note. The derivative of velocity which is basically like the slope of the rock, slope of the velocity, which is which is acceleration. So, so acceleration is v prime of t. So the velocity is derivative as of some time. Okay, so let's use this information. The position of a particle is given by the equation. S of t equals t cubed subtract 6t squared plus 15t, where s is measured in meters and t is measured in seconds. It's generally defined what s and t are re relating to. Right, so anyway, this is the question, where, where, yeah, this is the information we're going to use to answer some questions. So if we would pause the video, write all this down, because we're going to need this space to actually start answering these questions. So pause the video now, get a copy. I'm about to change the screen. All right, so look at the first example. The first um, statement asks to find the velocity at time t. So since s of t equals to t cubed subtract 6t squared plus 15t, it says find velocity. You should know that velocity uh, basically means, or instantaneous velocity, basically means uh, derivative. So it's actually find the derivative of this function. So the derivative of s of t should be 3 t squared subtract 12t plus 15. So by saying find velocity, again, it actually find instantaneous velocity. The second part says to uh, what is the value, what is the velocity after two seconds? Basically, that means at two seconds. I'm sorry, at two seconds. What's the velocity at two seconds? So if that's true, they want you to find the root of at two seconds. So that's true. Well, first of all, this is the answer for A. Answer choice A. Answer for A. And the next part is B. So to find the velocity at two seconds, you can plug in two for all the t's and um, in the derivative. So it's going to be three times two squared, subtract 12 times two plus 15. And you plug that in the calculator, sugar three. So the derivative at, at two seconds is three. But yeah, that's the velocity at two seconds. And let's be even more accurate. Let's say three meters per second, because we measure this in meters per second. The second part says after four seconds. So if that's true, you're going to find the derivative at four seconds. So S prime at four. You can plug in four for all the t's. This is going to be three times four squared, subtract 12 times four plus 15. If you do the math for that, the velocity at four seconds should be 15 meters a second. All right, so we just answered A and B from this. This is really small, so I'm going to rewrite it. Um, where, I'm going to write one question at a time so i got more space. So copy down whatever you need. I'm going to rewrite these questions one at a time as I answer the rest of those. But truthfully, if you want to go ahead and try to go without me and then try to catch up to see if you did, did them all right, feel free to start going ahead and, and actually start answering those questions. But if you want to enter this as a note, I'll copy it because I'm about to change the screen entirely. Okay, so the second part says, when is a particle at rest? So let's think about that. What does it mean for a particle to be at rest, right? If it's at rest, it's not moving. So essentially saying, when is the derivative 
equal to zero. So given the derivative of z, given that's the derivative, basically saying when is that equal to zero? 3t squared subtract 12t plus 15. When is it equal to zero? So given that equation, there's lots of ways you can find out when it's zero. You can try to factor. Uh, you can try to use um, quadratic formula. I see all these numbers are visible by three. So I might try factoring first. It's going to be zero equals a three. Then t squared subtract 4t plus 5. That's great they got a 3 there. I can write it away. So 0 equals to t squared subtract 4t plus 5. That's pretty easy to factor. You might know that, that factors the b. Uh, it's the x game. So it's going to be 5 on top, negative 4 on the bottom. Look for numbers. Multiply be um, 5, add up to be 4. Well, in this problem, there aren't any numbers. So you can multiply by 5 and add by 4. So that's not factorable. So we could try a quadratic formula, which is negative b plus or minus square root of b squared, subtract 4ac. So you can find the zeros there over 2a. And that will give you 4 plus or minus the square root of 16, subtract 4 times 1 times 5. I can stop there, and I can see that's going to be imaginary. Because 16 subtract 20 is negative 4, so it's imaginary. So it won't ever be 0. So that's true. Uh, this particle is never at rest. Never at rest. This particle is always moving forward. All right, let's go on. And the reason why it's always moving forward is there's no zeros. All right, you can't find a way of making that 0. Since you can't make it 0, it never actually gets to the place where it stops. So that's why we say it's always moving forward. It could always move, it could be always moving backwards. Um, but considering this equation is, has a positive leading coefficient, I know it rises as you go to the right. So I know it's always moving forward. All right, going on. Okay, so the next example says, when is the particle moving forward? All right, so what we just decided was it has to be always moving forward. But, you know, I like to have more than one way of making sure that I'm right. I like to have more than one way of knowing for sure that I'm right. So let's graph it. Let's go to Desmos. Let's actually graph that equation. If you graph that equation, it looks like this red line here. So that's the original function. The original function, S of T. So it looks like it never starts going downward. It looks like it's always rising. But I'm going to zoom out a bit just to see if I'm right. And if I zoom out a bit, it still looks like it kind of starts flattening out there, but it doesn't. It just keeps rising. Like it would need a, a place where it bottoms out, like a bottom of parabola to be a zero. So since it never does that, it never actually bottoms out. If I zoom out some more, it doesn't actually come down again. So I'm pretty sure that's never going to come down again. All right, so that's the first question. The question was, when is the particle moving forward? And it looks like it's always moving forward. Just make sure I'm right again. I'm going to look at the derivative. I've already got the equation typed in for the derivative here. I don't know if you can see it or not, but this is it. So that's the equation, 3x squared, subtract 12x plus 15. It looks like my 3 got cut off the screen, but it's there. So when I graph it, I see the derivative function is here. And I notice the derivative is never beneath the x-axis, meaning that the velocity is always positive, so it never actually stops. The velocity is always positive, so this graph, this graph is actually always going forward, because all of the velocity is above the x-axis. So I'm pretty sure, 100% sure, this graph never goes backwards. All right, almost done. One last, well, another example. But the answer to this question would be always. Or you might say from negative infinity to positive infinity. With closed brackets, like it never, there's never a place where it's not moving forward. All right, moving on. All right, the next section of the question asks, draw a diagram that represents the motion of the particle. Well, we just did that in Desmos. The motion of the particle is the original function. So the original function is this red line. So this would represent the original, that would be a diagram that represents the motion of the particle. All right, going on to the next question. All right, the next part says, find the total distance traveled by the particle in the first five seconds. So basically, the particle is represented by this equation. Or better yet, the movement of the particle is represented by this equation. If I want to know the total distance it traveled, during the first five seconds, I want to know 
where the initial distance was, so s at 0, and I want to know s at 5. Good thing about s at 0, in this case, it basically means s of 0. So s at 0 basically means s of 0. s at 5 means s at 5, because it's 0. So s at 0 is what I want to know, and s at 5 is what I want to know. s of 0 should be 0. Everything goes to 0. S at 5 should be, S at 5 should be 50. So if I want to find a distance from 0 to 5, I basically want to start at the right and start backwards. So 50 should track the original distance. It's 50. So I would say the answer to this is 50 meters. So I basically take whatever my, new di my final distance to track my original distance. And that tells me that's 50 meters. All right. I think I'm out of time. That's where we're going to stop. So without, with that being said, good luck.